Thank you so much for, for coming here. I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the fascinating scientific discoveries, as well as some of the work that we do in Bell Labs. What I really actually enjoy is, is talking about other people's work. I think appreciating the ingenuity of other researchers throughout history and what they've come up with and how they've come up with is a beautiful thing. So let's take a look at this. This is the, the great electromagnetic spectrum. And it's amazing how much, as human beings, we are obsessed with this. And so much of the work we do is actually sits on the spectrum. So I'll show you a fraction of a fraction of it, okay? So on the top left, somebody took an antenna and pointed to the sky. And they were reading some noise, a noise they couldn't explain. But they didn't give up on the fact that, that they thought this was noise. They went as far as getting rid of the pigeons that were sitting in the antenna, because this was a very large antenna. And then the consequence of that was the discovery of the cosmic background radiation, and then led to the proof of the Big Bang, and of course, the Nobel Prize from Bell Labs. And following that, if I can see this, because it's super bright on the stage here. Sorry, yeah, that, was the, that was the first one was the, uh, the phase area. The second one was the cosmic background radiation. Or you could figure out that if you take photons and you focus them, you can actually suspend matter, and you can suspend biomaterial in the middle, and you create what's an optical tweezer and you get a Nobel Prize for that. Again, leveraging the electromagnetic spectrum in somewhat of an unconventional way. And as human beings, we've also figured out that we can take a whole bunch of photons, we can manipulate their phase and their amplitude and put them through a thin piece of glass kilometers away across the ocean and put a, an inconceivable amount of data through it and break the world record every year and Bell Labs is pioneered every year putting more and more data through a fiber optic cable, which is an extraordinary thing. Or you can take, you can discover that you can take the same photons and you can put them in some kind of a material and they convert back into electrons. You can measure that current and you can interpret how much light there is and then you'll invent the charge coupled device. You'll get a Nobel Prize for that. The foundation of almost every imaging device that has been made. Nowadays we've, we're using a different technology but the foundation is the same. Or one of my favorite, this one is not from Bell Labs but I include it, is the discovery that if you hit materials with photons you can excite them in a specific way. And the photons that come back, a very, very small percentage of them, are not the same as the photons you hit them with. And within that is the information of the chemical infrastructure of the material. You discover Raman spectroscopy, the foundation of so much creation of medicine and detecting chemical bonds between materials. And it keeps going. You can figure out that you can manufacture materials so small that they're comparable to the wavelength of light and they interact with different wavelengths and create really interesting effects of filtering and amplifying light. You create quantum dots, the foundation of so many displays that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, another Nobel Prize, this one also from Bell Labs. Or that you can go beyond diffraction limits of microscopes by creating fluorescence and see things that traditional microscopy wouldn't allow you to see because of the limitations of the lenses. And then again, you win a Nobel Prize. I mean, these are amazing things from species with brains made of meat that we can even figure this out. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. So now having said that, of course, Bell Labs has a long history, and there's many, many inventions and many Nobel Prizes and various other prizes that Bell Labs has, has created over its past 100 years, and we just celebrated our centennial, and even including things like Oscars uh, that, that the institution has won. But let me tell you something that is really, really important and perhaps not as appreciated. Consider the pandemic. So during the pandemic, we spend so much time worrying about what happens to our medical centers, what happens to our doctors, what happens to our vaccine distributions. We were worried about our entire medical infrastructure breaking down. But really nobody talked about the fact that the entire planet, almost overnight, changed their habit of how they consume data, where they consume data, what applications they use, what kind of pressure they're putting on the communication infrastructure, on our servers, on our clouds, on our base stations. It changed overnight and it just worked, right? This was an exponential curve, and it just happened. Now, I want you to think if this pandemic had happened a decade earlier, it would have crippled us because we couldn't do any of the remote work. Everything you did that allowed you to continue to innovate, continue to work, was because of the infrastructure. So make sure you hug an engineer. Well, now the COVID is over, so it should be okay. So what are we trying to do in the future of telecom? Really. Ultimately, as human beings, we want to merge our physical world and our digital world in some way. And that requires the digital world and the physical world to be fused at a fundamental way. 
Now, at the end of the day, we are all physical human beings, so we need to interact with the physical world. And if you look at how people talk about the future communication infrastructures, they set forth a set of technologies. Now, interestingly, majority of those technologies are still physical world interface devices, meaning that you still have to send signals over the air, lights through the fiber, you still have a physical device, you still have physical components to operate. And that's not going to change. So the world, in order to enable these emerging applications, actually runs on silicon. And it all started with this. This is the world's first transistor that I got an opportunity to hold in my hand briefly with a white glove and everything. And at the time, somebody took a picture of me. This is 2016, almost a decade ago. And it was with an iPhone 6S back then. And that iPhone had tens of billions of transistors in it. Billions, with a B. Within a human lifetime. This is amazing. But there is another aspect of it, which is a bit bittersweet. You see, I could fill this entire room with experts. And everybody in this room will not be able to hold in their hand the entire operation of an iPhone from end to end. From material engineering, semiconductors, the programming, the display, the radios, the cloud, the software, the cameras, everything. This is not the first time that human beings have created something that we can't collectively explain even in a large room, but this is the first time this thing is in everybody's pockets. And it just works. Now, the issue with that is that the magic is gone. The awe, the wonder is gone. And when that is gone from technology, we do a disservice to a generation that follows. Because that magic is inspiration for curiosity. And everything just works. So we should not lose sight of that. But semiconductor manufacturing is a marvel of engineering. I mean, almost inconceivably so. In fact, the equipment used to manufacture semiconductors is so important that it's often a talk of geopolitical conflict. Because this equipment is what makes everything. You remove that room, that yellow room from TSMC, all iPhones, all processors, all memory, everything, so much will be affected almost instantly. So of course, naturally, it's a concern. Now having said that, I'm sure you've heard of Moore's Law, right? Moore's Law, Moore, Back then, back when he was in Intel, he's, he kind of figured out that the number of transistors in semiconductor devices was doubling about 18 months or so. And he said that this is going to stay this way, and he was right for decades. And in fact, it did. Now, many times people came and said, oh, Moore's Law is over, Moore's Law is over, and it always continued. Now, I wouldn't say Moore's Law is over, but there is a shift. You see, when you make semiconductor devices very, very large, and you reach about 100 billion transistors in a single chip, what ends up happening in that, despite all the advancements, the yield begins to drop. Once the yield begins to drop to hits about 50%, it means that you need to make two chips for one to work. And that's an economic problem, because it pushes the issue on, well, how is this going to work out economically? So we need a new solution. Now, what's the rational solution if you want to get to a trillion transistor? Well, the solution is obvious. Take your chip and make two chips out of it, instead of making one really large one. But the problem is, as soon as you do this, the interconnect that you used to have inside the chip are no longer connected in the chip. They need to go out into something else before they reach. And that is a massive, massive power penalty to pay in semiconductor design. So it doesn't come for free. But people have already started to do this, which means the real problem to take Moore's law from a chip level to a macro level, a collection of chips, one level higher, is a packaging problem, is an integration problem. So we started looking at this, and we said, well, what's on the left side? Right? Or in this case, would be semiconductors. Semiconductors have extraordinary lithography, extremely small wires. In, in, a, in a millimeter, you can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of interconnect. On the other side, we have the things that everyone's familiar with, printed circuit boards. They're ubiquitous. They're cheap. They're everywhere. But the problem is that the lithography, the resolution between these two technologies is vastly different. So we needed a new material. And a few years ago, about four or five years ago, we started looking at glass. Now, glass is a very interesting material because it has some unique properties. It can have lithography that kind of rivals, gets close to semiconductors, not the, the smallest node, but close enough that it makes the divisions of those circuits much more possible. On the other hand, it can be made into panels, like printed circuit boards can. So its cost can drop exponentially. So we started exploring this. But you have to remember, when a new material comes onto the scene, it's the chemists. 
It's the physicists who are creating it. They are not electrical engineers. They are not circuit designers. We have to figure out how to leverage the strength of this new material for our application. So we started making different things in it. And it took a lot of trials, a lot of attempts. These beautiful photos that you see are various designs embedded in glass. So the substrate material of these components are all made of glass. So we take the glass and we can put integrated circuits on top of them and create really, really complex structures. In fact, we can push this to some extraordinary complexity. So here's an example of a glass substrate where we have 65 sub-terahertz. These are circuits that are operating above 110 gigahertz of frequency all on top of the glass. Now this is a lot of complication from an engineering point of view because you need to solve signal loss problems. You need to solve resolution lithography problem, integration problem. And if you look at this, the glass is actually really, really complicated. Every layer of the material is used. The surface of the material has electrical connections. You can interconnect things using the surface. The middle of it is made of glass. Inside of the glass is where all the electromagnetic waves travel. It's really black magic. If you've ever looked at electromagnetic simulations, it's non-intuitive. But of course, science doesn't care if something's intuitive to us. It just has to work. And we manipulate all of those within the glass platform. And then on the other side of this, again, because we're looking at very high lithography, we can have 256 antennas. Now, you may think this is a very large piece. This is actually not a very large piece. It's the size of an Apple Watch. So 256 antennas, individual antennas, for a beamforming application can fit in that space because the frequency is so high. When the frequency goes up, everything gets smaller, including the antennas and their spacing. So this is a very interesting packaging problem. Now, there is so much complexity in this. And the complexity comes from the fact that you have to design the entire stack. So the, all of the semiconductors that go in there are designed from scratch at Bell Labs. All of the packaging that you sell using glass, all designed, again, from scratch at Bell Labs. And these create this really interesting integration of these materials together. Now, there's one other thing we want to do. Of course, ultimately, when we make something, the really test is when it's put outside into the real world. And just last year, in, during the Paris Olympics in 2024, our colleagues showed the radio and glass technology in the core of one of their products, demonstrating the first outdoor full duplex back to our backhaul radio. Now, you may not know what a backhaul radio is, but I'll make it simple. A backhaul radio is basically a wireless connection between two fixed points. And the reason it's so important is because there are many places where there is no fiber. So you have to put a cell, phone, cell tower. That cell tower collects all of the data coming from all your cell phones. Now it reaches the tower. It needs to go somewhere. It needs to reach the cloud. From there, a backhaul can offload all of that traffic over the air somewhere else where there is fiber. And then it gets into the cloud. So backhaul fiber, and all the interconnect are core to the connectivity of our infrastructure. And all of these interconnectivity te technologies get upgraded every year, especially with generations of 5G, 6G, and so on. Now, I want to show you one last thing. During, uh, when, when we were celebrating one of the Nobel Prizes that Bell Labs was associated with in 2024, Louis Bruce put this up. And I was in the front, so I managed to get a picture of it. And in there, he had a certain list of advice for students. The one that always caught my attention was the one just before the last one. And that is that problems that are very difficult to solve in your field may actually be very trivial in a different field. And that is the beauty of Bell Labs. Because of its extraordinary multidisciplinary nature, you can go across the hall and speak with somebody with completely complementary background knowledge and information to the, one, to the thing that you're working on. And from that, you can create these interesting connections between technologies, which is actually the, the, the next most important thing. One of the reasons people keep talking about AI being so powerful is because AI can create those connections that perhaps can escape us. But institutions like Bell Labs have been doing this for a century. And we will continue to do this, because that is exactly how the new generation of new ideas and new connection between technologies can emerge. So with that, I'll leave you with this, and I wanted to say thank you for going through this talk with me, and congratulations to Bell Labs for a 100-year celebration. Thank you.